I'd like to introduce Matt Coggins. Matt Coggins is our senior medical director on the AAV side. So Matt um, currently is the medical director for our Danin disease program, our um, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy program, and some future programs that we may be um, starting soon. So with that, and, and Matt is also a uh, cardiologist, so we're very lucky to have him. And Matt, thank you very much for uh, educating us today. Thanks, Latika. Um, thanks to the planners, too. Uh, I just want to extend that. And, uh, and also, I'll just come out now. I don't have any uh, cahoots, but bear with me. If you, if you could. Um, no, it's, it's a privilege to be here. Thanks. Uh, to talk with you about dilated cardiomyopathy. And, and we'll, we'll distinguish and focus really on the um, familial and genetic forms of the disease. This figure on the bottom right of the slide is meant to show that um, Dilated cardiomyopathy, or DCM, is a progression of increased dimension, increased chamber dimension uh, of one or both of the cardiac ventricles. In this case, we're seeing an enlargement of the left ventricle. That's typically accompanied by a thinning of the muscle wall, and, and importantly, there is a reduction in contractility, the force generation of the heart muscle. And these arrows, too, are meant to show that even though there's an enlargement of the heart, uh, there's actually a weakening of the muscle so that the amount of blood pumped with each heartbeat is reduced. Uh, there's a number of insults that can lead to this common picture of reduced heart function, um, and, and they are actually a common reason for presentation of patients with heart failure, arrhythmias, reduced quality of life, uh, reduced life expectancy. And when a provider sees a patient with this picture, with reduced heart function, um, the goal is to uh, identify the acquired forms, and so the acquired forms being things like coronary artery disease, um, toxins, alcohol exposure, uh, chemotherapeutic agents, uh, tachycardias, et cetera, um, viruses. And, and when those acquired forms of the disease have been ruled out, what's left are the unexplained or what's called idiopathic forms of DCM. And at about 20 to 50 percent of those idiopathic DCM cases are actually found to be familial. And a substantial proportion of those then have uh, an identifiable uh, genetic cause. Um, there's about 30 genes that have been identified and been implicated in causing DCM and really, you know, representing a, a diverse uh, number of biological processes within the cardiomyocytes, and, and really each one can be thought of as a rare genetic disease. And it's that notion, um, really, I mean, that fact that this collection of rare genetic diseases together accounts for a really substantial proportion of this condition of DCM that's the driver for um, an effort towards education and increased awareness. It's that uh, heightened vigilance, increased awareness um, that we try to share with providers and patients too. The um, identification of patients and really ultimately our understanding of these diseases together really depends on that heightened awareness leading to uh, increased gene testing and evaluation of families, identifying those at risk to help us learn more about the disease. Um, on the bottom part of the slide here, I've referred to this, um, this collection of, of rare diseases as the pathways to DCM. Uh, just some more sort of details about, about this clinically. We've talked about how 20 to 50% of cases of idiopathic DCM are in fact familial in nature. Um, the age of onset, there are certainly pediatric presentations, but largely these are adult onset diseases in the 30s and 40s, um, 30 to 40 years that is. Um, we talked about the genetic defects that can disrupt diverse cellular processes, and this is really anything from structural, cytoskeletal, uh, uh, sarcomere, so that's sort of the, the ultrastructural uh, contractile machinery of the cardiomyocytes, uh, membrane ion channels, and cell traffic and, re and repair pathways. These are all implicated in causes of disease. And just as an example, um, I've listed here uh, BAG3, BCL-associated uh, athenogen 3, as one of the identified causes of rare DCM. It accounts for about 3% of the identified genetic causes. Um, this is a particular interest at Rocket. There's, a, as of course many of you know, there is a preclinical um, program looking to address the root genetic cause of this form of DCM. Um, I'd just like to touch on the treatment um, just to point out that when patients are identified with these genetic forms of DCM, with some exceptions, 
for example, earlier uh, use of ICDs or earlier institution of therapies, really the, the treatment adheres to the standard treatment for heart failure, um, which is guideline directed and in many, case, many patients is helpful, but none of them um, have, and it, it, well I should say, all of these uh, sort of adhere to what Kennery is describing as diseases without an FDA approved therapy. Um, and so with that, I'll move on to Erica. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Matt, for this uh, clear um, overview of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Sorry. <coughs> so my name is Erika. Hello, everybody. Um, Erika Zanumantri. I'm a global program head and a senior VP of uh, development operations at Rocket. And it's my honor to really uh, moderate uh, the next segment of our program, which is on the rare disease uh, diagnosis RDC. And I have really some amazing guests who will be joining me, and um, they, will, um, they will share their personal individual statement first, and then we will engage in a, in a panel discussion. So uh, join me in welcoming our rare heroes, starting um, to on the stage with Becky. So Becky is a patient, uh, DCM patient and caregiver. Please come in, have a seat. And, um, and, and Becky's uh, reason for being here with us is to share a message of hope with patients and, and families and really the sense of urgency to find better treatments and, and potentially cure. Um, then please welcome Abigail Yeso. Thank you. So, Abby, Abby is a genetic counselor at uh, Texas, Texas Children's Hospital, and um, she shared with me that she sees herself as a professional reassurance provider, and she <laughs> will share a little bit more of this with us. And last but not least, uh, via Zoom, um, please welcome Greg Ruff. Do we have Greg? Yes, welcome Greg. <laughs> Uh, Greg is the executive director and board president of the DCM Foundation, and Greg's mission is to bring education, hope, and resources to DCM patients and families. So with this, thank you very much, uh, Becky, Abby, and Greg for joining, and I will uh, hand it on to Becky for her statement. Thank you. Hi, all. I'm Becky Graciano. Thank you all for having me. Thank you to Erica and Matika for organizing the entire planning committee for this fantastic event. And you will have to bear with me. I'm not much for public speaking. For once, I think I'm actually excited to be on beta blockers. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, a I was diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy from BEG3 um, back in March of 2022, and I'm excited to share my story. But first, a bit about me. I live in Oakland with my husband and our two kids. They're ages nine and five, two boys. Um, for work, I'm a medical physicist, so I work in radiation oncology, and I do have a PhD, but I'm definitely not an MD, and I think that can make me kind of a challenging patient because there are aspects of my care I really understand and can go deep on, but then I won't know the first thing about basic cardiac function, so my doctors never know what they have to explain. And um, yeah, prior to my diagnosis, I was pretty active. I was actually kind of a quarantine cliche where I started baking sourdough and I got a Peloton and became addicted. I was working out six or seven days a week. So I never suspected anything was going on health-wise. But then one day I started to experience some, some unusual fatigue and shortness of breath. And I, my COVID tests were coming back negative, so I ignored these and so many other symptoms. And if I could give my former self advice, and actually everyone here, but especially women, because I do think we have a tendency to gaslight ourselves, is to please listen to your body and trust your intuition when it's telling you something's off. It's okay to rest, it's okay to get help. And I wish I had followed that because less than a week later, I was on a one night mini getaway with my son and in a hotel room. I just woke up gasping for air. I felt like I was drowning on dry land. I kept waiting for it to get better, but after hours, it only got worse. So I eventually woke my son up and drove him the 45 minutes home and rushed myself to the nearest ER. And it was there, I received a battery of tests and scans, it took forever. And eventually the ER doctors told me that I had a lot of fluid in my lungs and edema. 
and that something about my heart function, that in my incoherent state, I was hyper-focused, that I needed to go into work and all these other things. I took it to mean that once this excess fluid was gone, I'd be fine and my heart would go back to normal. So imagine my surprise when a volunteer dropped off some reg registration packet that included a folder titled, Heart Failure, What You Need to Know. And I was sure it was for someone else. The floor was swamped, everybody was overwhelmed, no one had time, but eventually a nurse came in and confirmed that yes, I had heart failure, that they were trying to make me comfortable and let the medications work, and I'd probably see a doctor tomorrow morning. And so I remember calling my husband, who, because of COVID at the time, couldn't come to the hospital until I had a room. He was on his way, and I was sobbing, and I told him, I'd logged onto my chart, my echo results had just posted, and there was this foreign term ejection fraction, and mine was at 14%, and Google was making that sound bad, so could he please figure it out? And, you know, he called a bunch of our friends that happened to be doctors. They immediately got involved and took charge. They contacted the attending who confirmed to have dilated cardiomyopathy, most likely from an infection because they didn't have an obvious family history and no history of substance abuse and that he was gonna have me transferred to UCS or, or Stanford for more specialized care, but it would take maybe a week for a bed to become available. When my friends made calls on my behalf and sure enough, the next morning, bright and early, I was in an ambulance on my way to UCSF. And besides making these calls, they also offered to babysit and they found out that our three-year-old had hand and foot and mouth, and that was like a mom fail because I thought the blisters were just from new shoes, but then they spread to his hands. And so one of them clued in immediately and was like, this is Coxsackie's virus, she needs to be tested, which I was, and the results came back positive. And that's known to cause viral myocarditis. And I was happy to be at UCSF, but it, I mean, I think this whole process really was eye-opening and kind of highlights the in inequity in our healthcare system. I never thought I'd benefit from my personal network and who I know influencing the quality of care and the speeds of service. And so it's made me think much more deeply about health care equity reform. But at UCSF, I had a ton of doctors. I had um, staff that I felt like prioritized my care and listened and explained. I stayed there for a little over a week. And when I did get to go home, I had to wear that Zoll life vest, which is an external defibrillator. I was so weak, I actually moved into the basement bedroom because I couldn't walk upstairs. And <laughs> my son, who was in first grade, ended up telling all his classmates and his teachers, my mom has really bad heartburn, so she lives in the basement now. <laughs> and so that was fun to explain. And as overjoyed as I was to be back home with my family and surrounded by such incredibly supportive family and friends, it was still really scary. I had no idea what my life was gonna look like going forward or even if I had that much life left. I don't know if you guys know this, but sometimes the internet's not the best place to go to for medical advice. You can go down some really dark rabbit holes when you're compulsively Googling heart failure at 3 a.m. But one of the good things that came out of all my doom scrolling was I stumbled upon the DCM Foundation's website, and there I met Greg, who you guys are gonna hear from. He's one of the most inspiring individuals ever met. He connected me to other patients and got me involved in this community. I joined the support groups, and it's crazy how these people from all across the globe all genders, ages, races, all walks of life have quickly become my friends and my confidants. I mean, they can tell me the exact same thing my therapist will be saying over and over, but coming from them, it resonates. And thankfully, you know, they've helped me through some very dark and challenging times. Unfortunately, today I'm doing much better, but it's still hard. This is a chronic illness. There is no cure. I'm on tons of medication. I suffer from fatigue and brain fog and low blood pressure and some other unpleasant side effects. Um, I think it's made harder because I don't necessarily present as sick to the outside world, so it makes it challenging to ask for help. And I've had to learn how to say no and how to prioritize my health over my FOMO, which is not good. But the worst part is really the worry. And yes, you know, I worry a little bit about myself, but now more than anything, I worry about my family because we did find out that there's a genetic component so it wasn't until my first outpatient cardiology appointment that my doctor, Dr. Marco, said something else has to be going on. She recommended genetic testing. She said my left ventricle shouldn't be this large from just a single viral acute insult. 
And so when the results came back, it showed I had a pathogenic BAG3 mutation. And this was hard. I knew nothing about BAG3. I never even heard the term. But luckily, I had the services of fantastic genetic counselor, Athena, to get me through it. She did resources and literature. She ordered genetic testing for our children. She also helped me navigate some really difficult conversations. Um, both my parents had unfortunately passed away already from non-cardiac issues. So I have a lot of aunts and uncles, some who I'm really close to, but others who I maybe talked to once or twice a year. And I was dreading how to tell them, but she gave me the language and tools and scripts and really helped ease a lot of my anxiety. And it turns out my sister, who's older, also carries the mutation. She was totally asymptomatic, but now she's on but she does have a reduced ejection fraction, so now she's on medication and has made appropriate lifestyle changes. And then her son, my nephew, who's 13, also carries um, the mutation. And he's the best kid. Like Anybody who meets him loves him. He's so charming, everything. But he's always had severe ADHD, and he's been on medication for that for years. And his cardiologist was able to work with his psychologist to switch his medication to a type that's less likely to damage his heart. So we're really grateful for that knowledge. As for my own children, both of them also tested positive, And I asked, please don't share this outside the space. It is personal information, and we're trying to protect their privacy. But I do think it's an important part of the story. Um, their echoes have both shown moderate dilation, so they've already started low doses of nilapril. And they've been such troopers through the whole process with all the testing, and blood draw and just constant appointments. And I'm so grateful we have this knowledge and that we know for them and for my nephew and my sister, it's wonderful, but it also still sucks. I mean, <sighs> logically, I know it's not my fault, but then the irrational part of my brain thinks it's my job as a parent to protect my kids and that I'm failing at that by passing that on. Thank you. And so that's why I worry so much. I worry about them, about these people I love and that mean the world to me. I worry about all the other DCM patients I've met in this community that have been amazing. Some who are, oh, thank you, <laughs> struggling so much more than me, waiting heart transplants or don't know how they're gonna afford the escalating costs of their medications, yet they still go so much and are always there to offer advice and encouragement. So I worry that not enough's being done and that I'm not doing enough. But then what brings me hope is looking at the same community and our allies and seeing the strides we're making towards raising awareness. We're raising awareness about this disease. We're raising awareness about how to advocate for yourself and your loved ones within the healthcare system. And we're raising awareness about the importance of genetic testing. And I think this awareness will bring about more research and a better understanding of the disease. I think that will lead to better therapies and more efficient treatments and hopefully eventually a cure. And the other thing that brings me hope is being here today and seeing such talented and passionate individuals like you all that are working on the treatment of rare diseases. And it's not just BAG3, although obviously that is near and dear to my heart, pun intended. Um, it's just knowing that the stories of patients like me and my children are being heard and that brilliant minds are working towards solutions. So thank you all for what you do. Your work is so meaningful and so necessary, and you just all have my eternal gratitude. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Becky, for sharing your story with, uh, with such vulnerability thank and you. courage. Sorry. I wasn't meaning to get so emotional. Uh, but but it's yes, thank you, Abby. Um, so Abby, our genetic counselor, will share a statement as well. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to have been placed right at the time frame where all of your caffeine should be hitting. So everyone <laughs> should be super attentive by this point. Um, thank you so much to Latika Hickey, uh, who invited me to speak with you today, as well as the entire Rocket team for coordinating this wonderful event. Latika asked me to touch on a question that I've been asked to answer hundreds of times throughout my education and my career, 
uh, what is a genetic counselor? <laughs> um, despite having answered this many, many times, I've struggled to put together a concise description to present to all of you today. It would be simple to describe genetic counselors as medical providers um, who specialize in providing access to genetic technologies and to education regarding those technologies, interpretation of those same results, and so on. They help to put into perspective the risk that comes with a positive genetic result or the reassurance that may be provided by a negative result. But this concise description cannot possibly capture what it is that we do on a daily basis. It fails to demonstrate the uncertainty that's brought on by a predictive or non-diagnostic genetic result and the variant interpretation that we often have to provide. It does not describe the emotional experience of being present for patients who have lost a loved one to cardiovascular disease and who are doing everything in their power to protect their own family members. It certainly it does not capture the overwhelming feeling of achievement we experience when we can explain a patient's diagnosis to them using the ever-expanding genetic technologies that are available to us. Though we are medical professionals, we are also educators, sources of support, advocates, researchers, experts in and navigators of uncertainty. I chose to become a genetic counselor because I wanted the opportunity to be something new for my patients every day. I attended Baylor College of Medicine for my graduate school education. And if you told me then that I would be practicing cardiovascular genetic counseling and specializing in inherited cardiomyopathies and arrhythmias, my jaw would have hit the floor. <laughs> cardiovascular genetics is notably challenging. It is a subspecialty uh, that is difficult to navigate given the multifactorial nature of these types of diseases. Ultimately, we all share so much more than our genes with our families. We breathe the same air, we eat the same food, we live in the same homes. And it is a combination of all of these factors that ultimately determines our risk for cardiovascular disease. My job is often to comb through a family history to find the patterns that make us most suspicious of a distinct genetic etiology for someone's diagnosis or clinical history. I work as a member of our CV genetics team at Texas Children's Hospital alongside physicians, advanced practice providers, clinic coordinators, other genetic counselors, um, in order to provide comprehensive genetic care for patients who have a broad spectrum of cardiovascular disease. We see families at the very beginning of their diagnostic odyssey when they've just received a diagnosis and they may be looking for answers. Uh, we also see patients throughout their clinical follow-up and also see patients to reassess the possible genetic uh, component to their disease and help to, um, offer, to basically to connect them with emerging treatments and options that may be available to, available to them based on a genetic diagnosis they had not received previously. Uh, often, I also see established patients and I help to connect them to advocacy groups. Uh, I, Greg is gonna talk briefly about the DCM Foundation and oftentimes, um, I do connect patients with them as well. Perhaps one of the most challenging aspects of any diagnosis, genetic or otherwise, is the isolation that it can cause. Many of my patients struggle with the hiddenness of their illness. A heart condition is not often something that can be seen. Um, and many individuals may appear to be completely healthy to the average person. This can be especially difficult for children, um, especially when they're restricted from certain athletic activities or pulled from school repeatedly for appointments. To the outsider, their struggles may be completely invisible, which creates psychological challenges for my patients that can be difficult to overcome. Through connecting with other children who may face the same day-to-day -day struggles, they can feel validation. Um, often, that can be life-changing for them. And sometimes it can 
be negative. It can be further isolating for them to meet people who have the same disease but perhaps have a different clinical presentation, a different history, and a different experience with their illness. A few weeks ago, I encountered a case that I feel exemplifies how genetic testing cannot merely provide clinical answers but also psychological ones. A set of siblings were referred to our clinic based on a recently identified familial variant in the MYH7 gene, which is one of the most common genes associated with all types of cardiomyopathy, so it can be seen in dilated cardiomyopathy as well. Both of these siblings were found to carry the same variant, um, which was first identified in their mother, who had severe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Though she had pleaded with doctors for years <laughs> that her symptoms, her fatigue, her shortness of breath were far past the norm. Um, they repeatedly told her that there were no signs of an issue and that she should consider losing weight. After finally receiving an echocardiogram that identified her diagnosis, she underwent open heart surgery. Um, it likely saved her life. <laughs> the Genetic variant that was identified can be associated with all types of cardiomyopathies, as I mentioned, and it's present meant that most likely her disease progression was almost completely out of her control. The gene alone um, is not necessarily enough for someone to develop the disease, and so in discussion with the family, I talked about how even carrying this genetic variant means that you have somewhere around a 50% chance of developing cardiomyopathy across your lifetime. The siblings in front of me were both told that they had normal echocardiograms and that they would simply need to be monitored regularly in order to detect any early signs of disease so we could begin treatment. Before the visit, I had noted that one of the siblings had struggled with severe anxiety for much of her life, which had caused her a great deal of mental and even physical harm. The patient turned to me at the end of the session and said, so does this mean that I don't need the same surgery that my mother had? And I responded that though I could not predict the future, it was unlikely that she would need the same intervention. Because we knew that she was at an increased risk, there were many steps that we could take before she would need surgery. In that moment, I watched her affect change. I asked what was going through her head, and she said, I just feel so much relief. For this patient, a genetic diagnosis served to mitigate her overwhelming anxiety regarding the future. I cannot tell you how this information may serve her over the course of her life, but I can tell you that this case and many others will stay with me for a very long time. I could tell you about 100 other cases like this one, but I think that the takeaway is almost always the same. Genetic testing can offer answers, but it can offer so much more. It can give families an option for the future. It can offer relief, and sometimes it can offer reassurance that when you do carry a genetic change, your fate may not look like those of your family members because of how early on we're able to catch it. Rare Disease Day is a time where we can recognize the invisible struggles of those affected by genetic conditions and bring to light the ways in which we can continue supporting and bettering their lives. I am so grateful to the Rocket team and to all of you here today for being here and showing such overwhelming support for a cause that is near and dear to my heart. Thank you so much, and I will be here to answer additional questions at the conclusion of our presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abby, for the work you do and for educating us on, on genetic counseling and for advocating for it. Now, I will we'll, we'll cue, Greg, uh, cue up Greg's presentation and pass it on to Greg. Thank you, Greg. Good uh, morning, and uh, thank you all uh, for putting on this day. Thank you for Rocket. My apologies for not being there today. But today is actually my son's 32nd slash 8th birthday. We always do a huge family get together on February 29th for his birthday. And uh, we're in Florida celebrating. And in the middle of that, one of my grandkids decided to give me something. So I apologize for my voice and 
probably be coughing a bit, but I've, I've developed some type of bug. So, but thank you very much uh, for having us and and and, and supporting uh, our causes. Next slide, please. Again, thanks to all uh, at Rocket. Um, Rocket is a supporter of the DCM Foundation. Uh, we've known Latika for a long time. We appreciate her support and the support of the organization. Um, all the drug development that you're doing, and especially the development in genetic cardiomyopathies. Um, this is a huge opportunity, I think, for biopharma, a huge opportunity for patients. Uh, and, and we hope that you know, through our partnerships, we can actually save many, many lives. Next slide, please. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so my DCM journey, um, I was a track runner in high school. Uh, I, uh, in my senior year, I had severe tachycardia event uh, in a training session. So that makes me, I'm almost 60 years old uh, and was forced to quit track. Uh, they knew very little about uh, cardiomyopathies. The docs just said, don't run competitive track anymore. So I abandoned my hopes to run in college. Uh, and I lived life. I think I had some tachycardia events, never passed out, never anything between 1982 and, and being formally diagnosed, but I thought they were panic attacks or something. So, uh, uh, lived a normal life, exercised a lot, uh, which given my gene that I'll go to, uh, that causes the dilated cardiomyopathy was probably not the right thing for me to do. Um, and so, uh, the next event was in 2004. Um, I've been an entrepreneur my entire career and we were getting key man life insurance on the, uh, the key stakeholders of one of my businesses and it showed an abnormal EKG and a reduced ejection fraction. Um, actually, uh, it was, it was below 40% at that point. I went to see a cardiologist and they didn't do anything. And again, as I talk to patients at the DCM Foundation, you know, the vast, vast, vast majority, uh, you know, go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed for a long time. And I think I heard it, the number earlier, you know, it takes five years uh, to get a rare disease diagnosis. And that obviously is the case and probably even worse actually uh, with, with cardiomyopathies. Um, 2014, um, I was formally diagnosed. Um, I was at the, uh, uh, allergist, I have allergy issues. And uh, he said, Mr. Roof, your uh, uh, heart rate's 32 and very rhythmic. I'm going to call the squad. And I said, eh, relax, you know, you know, so I, I did go to my doc. Uh, was, I, I live in Columbus or Dublin, Ohio, um, was referred to the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and at that point, uh, in late March uh, 2014, um, they, they confirmed the 38% ejection fraction. I also had third degree uh, heart block and left bundle bench block. Um, and um, at that point in 2014, uh, they had a, uh, I had an ICD, uh, uh, I guess a, 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 a three wire device put in CRT. Uh, and for a period of time, my ejection fraction eroded down to 20%. Next slide, please. So what, what caused this? Um, uh, you know, I'll continue the, the journey. Um, and uh, I'm having a hard time reading that. Um, so, so basically, uh, it continued to to erode. Uh, you know, my ejection fraction. Um, I was getting sicker. I was having more and more uh, arrhythmogenic components uh, of of it. I was having a lot of PVCs, ATAC sessions, VTAC sessions. Um, and so I sort of sort of rode uh, the uh, journey with uh, uh, genetic dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, and 2018, thank you. Uh, uh, I I fraction went back down to 20 percent. Um, um, I started on amiodaro, uh, you know, which is essentially rat poison, uh, but it keeps you alive a while. And, and so I uh, was on amiodarone three years. Uh, and 2020, I had a severe tachycardia event requiring hospitalization um, and was hospitalized again in 2020 for congestive heart failure. 
and I always remained as active as I could with the disease, but 2020, my um, VO2 max decreased dramatically from 26 to 19. Um, and then I was put on the heart transplant list in 2021. Um, July 1st of that year, I was uh, uh, hospitalized for severe heart failure. Um, on July 6th, I had a VTAC storm for about 30, 45 minutes uh, where I just kept getting shocked over and over again, passing out, coming to, passing out, coming to. Um, the EP that I had actually we ran into the room was actually able to um, stabilize my heart by um, reprogramming my device. They put me on a balloon pump uh, to keep me alive from July 6th to July 15th. And then I was transplanted July 15th back home on July 24th. Next slide, please. Thank you for increasing the size. Um, so what caused it? Uh, so in my family, it was genetic um, and the genetic testing in 2014 at Cleveland Clinic. And again, I feel very uh, fortunate. Becky said being at UCSF, me going to Cleveland Clinic, um, very, very fortunate that we were at top sort of cardiology medical centers uh, that would give uh, genetic testing, unfortunately, or Baylor uh, for children's uh, Texas Children's, you know, most, we find most cardiologists, most uh, smaller, uh, you know, you know, heart failure uh, docs don't have the ability to do genetic testing, don't understand it, and don't order for their patients. Very fortunate uh, to have been at Cleveland Clinic. Um, so uh, I had the, the disease causing gene was lamina 331 from my father. I also had lemon 399 and TPM1 for, from my mother, uh, which I now I believe are, are variants of unso, uh, unsig, unsignificance, of unknown significance. Uh, and uh, grandfather, father, uncle all died from DCM related heart issues, but actually in their 70s. Uh, and nine family members of mine have one, two, or uh, all three of the variants. Uh, all three of my kids, um, and, and both of my neph nephews. Uh, so wonderfully, uh, no other living family members um, yet have to develop DCM from the variant, which we're very fortunate uh, with. But understanding uh, the gene variants that we have, uh, all, everybody that's tested positive uh, gets regular ECG um, echocardiogram testing. Next slide, please. So, uh, you know, there are two of my grandkids, Holden uh, and Eden. Um, I believe Eden was the one that caused me to get sick, but I still love her anyway. Uh, uh, you know, they have a 50-50 chance of having lamin A. And so, you know, I look at how I can spend the rest of my life. Um, and I think that the most important thing I can do as a husband, a father, and a grandfather is try to be part of the solution so that so that my kids don't get sick, my grandkids don't get sick, don't have to go through the things that I did. And also Becky, Becky's kids and the many other tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of patients out there with genetic cardiomyopathy. What can we do? What can I do personally to help create advanced therapies faster? Next slide, please. <laughs> Again, excuse me. Um, so amazingly, dilated cardiomyopathy affects probably about a 1 million people a year uh, are affected in the United States. Um, and as of 2017, there was no patient for dilated cardiomyopathy, no patient family group, which was absolutely shocking to me. So uh, Dr. Ray Hersberger and I at the Ohio State University, a longtime researcher on genetic dilated cardiomyopathy, started the DCM Foundation late 2017, really 2018. Um, and, and our mission is to provide hope and support to patients and family members with dilated cardiomyopathy through research advocacy um, in education. Next slide, please. Um, we, have, we have three foundational pillars that we can talk about. One is information in, in education, and um, I can go over this in a little more detail, but we have monthly newsletter, newsletters, we have webinars. You know, I bet we probably had 2,500 webinar registrants for our monthly webinars in 2023. Uh, we have social media. We have a dilated cardiomyopathy Facebook groups that we partner with a woman named Stephanie Fallon, uh, over 9,000 members. Um, and we do a lot of social media outreach um, and, and have pretty rapidly grown the foundation. Uh, we also do patient family support. 
through a, a, an, an online uh, annual conference. Uh, we have a, a patient uh, family uh, support groups. Uh, we're really focusing now on creating gene specific groups. Becky is heavily involved in our bag three Facebook group. We think one of the best ways to support patients. Uh, people uh, are akin to folks that have the same gene mutation as them. So we have a DSP group, BAG3, we're starting at MOH7. We partner with Team Titan, the laminatecardiac.org, uh, and we'll continue to, to create and grow additional uh, uh, gene-specific Facebook groups. And then we also created a partnership with seven other U.S.-based uh, cardiomyopathy organizations uh, to create the Genetic Cardiomyopathy Awareness Consortium. Next slide, please. Um, and I'll go a little bit, a couple, a couple minutes more about GCAC, if I could. Uh, so we, we created GCAC. Um, it's a separate, it, it's, it's run, owned, controlled by the DCM Foundation, um, but it, it includes Women Heart, Mended Hearts, Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association, SADS, which, which is arrhythmogenic, Children's Cardiomyopathy, uh, and Team Titan. And uh, we have a website, geneticcardiomyopathy.org. Um, we heard earlier that up to 50% of, of cardiomyopathy may have some type of genetic basis, and those percentages over time, as more research done is done, continues to grow. Uh, right now, there's been some, several studies in the last couple of years that only 1% of, of uh, people diagnosed with idiopathic cardiomyopathy get genetically tested even though the AHA, ACC, HFSA guidelines uh, recommend that you do. So we're working with uh, these other patient groups. We partner with Global Heart Hub to, to take the campaign global in 2023. Uh, we're partnering with HFSA, which I know you guys are a supporter of, Reimagine HF, to bring uh, this genetic awareness and cardiomyopathy to the, cardi to the cardiology community. Uh, and also working with several genetic testing companies to create more affordable, more transparent genetic testing and genetic counseling for, for patients that have been diagnosed with idiopathic cardiomyopathy. Again, uh, thank you very much uh, for supporting us. Thank you again for the Roof and Barango families that are affected with this disease uh, and all that you do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Thank you for sharing your, your journey with us. Thank you for the work you do at the DCM Foundation, and happy birthday to your son. Um, so with this, um, let's, um, let's talk a little bit more. Uh, so we'll start with, uh, with a few questions, and um, let's start with, uh, with you, Becky. Uh, as we, as you all, you, the three of you shared, the importance of genetic testing. So when you were faced with this decision of do I get tested or not, can you share with us a little bit your perspective on the pros and cons? Yeah, for me it was a no-brainer um, because it was actionable and the information could lead to more informed decisions about my care and help better tailor my treatments. So it just made so much sense. Um, I think the biggest con was the emotional toll it takes, but then I, again, weigh that with the how horrible I'd feel if there had been an ad adverse event and we didn't know. So it was a pretty easy decision to make. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And, and Greg, um, to you, similar question with the pros and cons of genetic testing, and you're certainly a, a big advocate with the DCM Foundation. Um, and I, I would, if you can tell us a little bit more of, of your motivation to, to start the DCM Foundation. Yeah, uh, and and luckily, uh, when I was tested and my, my family was tested, there was a woman named Anna Morales, um, which has been a long time researcher uh, of, of dilated cardiomyopathy genetics, so I had a very informed person. But again, it was not an issue. I mean, it's all about, you know, making the best decision. and You can make the best decision with the best information. So so that that was never never an issue for me. And what I found with the DCM Foundation in creating GCAC or the Genetic Cardiomyopathy Awareness Consortium um, is I don't think the real issue here 
is uh, getting people to say, I want to get genetically tested versus not getting genetically tested. I, you know, that is an issue that has to be dealt with. And I'm also on the national board, the American Board of Genetic Counseling, too. So, you know, I've gotten heavily involved, you know, to try to figure this thing out, uh, you know, nationally about genetic counseling. But really is it's about a lack of knowledge, I think. Um, and that from a health equity standpoint, uh, again, very lucky to be at Cleveland Clinic. Becky was very lucky to be at UCSF. But the vast, or, or, you know, or, or, or the patients at, at, you know, Texas Children's, right? But the vast majority of patients don't get that opportunity and they go undiagnosed, they go untested. And so, you know, I think, I think the real issue right now is, you know, you know, getting awareness out to patients, getting cardiologists to do the testing uh, and, and helping provide the infrastructure to do that cost effectively and seamlessly. So. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And so, Abby, so how do you help the, the patients and families navigate that decision? And, and to Greg's point, any, any thoughts in how further increasing the, the awareness about genetic testing and, and how you help as a genetic counselor? Yeah. Um, you know, as genetic counselors, we are trained to really take the most non-directive approach to genetic testing. And that just means that when we offer it as an option, it is always an option, right? It's not necessarily something that is prescribed as necessary for patients. Um, and it's not gonna make sense for every patient to undergo genetic testing. So supporting them in their decision to pursue or not pursue genetic testing is really a big part of my role. And that can either be for the patient themselves, for their affected family member. Oftentimes I coordinate post-mortem genetic testing. So we have a lot of conversations about you know, what would this person have wanted for themselves before they passed? And those are really difficult conversations. Um, I think that just making sure that you're providing the most accurate information as far as what genetic testing can offer, what, what things we can answer and we can't answer with that testing it is the biggest part of my role. As far as accessibility, I am very passionate about this issue, um, not just from the perspective that, I mean, we certainly need more genetic counselors, more boots on the ground who are able to perform genetic testing, but I also think that cardiologists are equally as capable of ordering and interpreting genetic tests. I work with many who are incredible at you know, coordinating that testing, ensuring that cascade testing and screening is occurring. So I think that one of the things that I ensure whenever I'm meeting with patients is I make sure that the family members who have a primary cardiologist are also informing that cardiologist about their genetic risk. Um, that patients who are outside of the age range that I'm able to test, that rather than testing them and then hoping that they follow up with a cardiologist, ensuring that they meet with someone, give that person my contact information and have a conversation about why genetic testing makes sense for that person. Not everyone is familiar with all of the genetic testing guidelines that are accessible. Um, and part of my role is to make sure that people know that those are out there um, and that we're developing more and more guidance for all providers to be able to feel empowered to order genetic testing. Thank you, thank you. Um, maybe pivoting a little bit to, um, to Becky. Um, so you shared the impact of the, of the disease uh, and the diagnosis. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more of what, what is a day in, in your life and how, how has your life changed and, and the perspective that genetic testing has provided to, to you that may be helpful? So I guess my big takeaway with this disease is how unpredictable it is. I hate that and I wish I could make everyone understand that. I have good days and bad days and I never know when the bad days are gonna come. And on a bad day, I have no energy. I have such brain fog. It's embarrassing to be at work and struggling over words I should know and just nothing comes out. And I just can't think clearly. And I just come home, I go on the couch. I have absolutely no time for my kids. I can't even interact and I hate that. And it's really hard. And then on my good days, I'm kind of, I wouldn't say normal, but more myself and I do have energy. So when you do see me out running or something, that's not gonna be me every day. And so just that unpredictability and not being able to plan your future or know, you know, is this a good week to go on vacation or am I just gonna be laid up? And just, I hate that part of it. But then with the genetic testing, just knowing that 
this is how it's gonna be and talking to other bag three patients and seeing how it's likely to progress and what their journeys has been gives me a lot more certainty and and it's taught me that it's not weird for this to be unpredictable. It's like this for a lot of people and that kind of brings me comfort and hope. Thank you, thank you for sharing, Becky. Uh, and Greg, so you shared, um, you, you live with a transplanted heart. So if you can share a little bit more of what a, a day for you is, and, and also if you can share um, your hope for innovative treatments and cures as, as uh, you're quite involved with the DCM Foundation. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think that starting off before the transplant, as, as Becky mentioned, I mean, you know, it just, it just feels like at times you're being sucked into abyss, into a, the deep abyss of, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, it's, it's, it's tough. I know you've got a meditative uh, session, I think, after this, but um, it's so important, when we tell our patients, it's so important that you get emotional support as you go through. It's very, very difficult. Uh, your view of yourself, how others view you, how you interact. Uh, as, as you're up and down or getting sicker, it changes and it's difficult to deal with that. And so that's really, really important. Um, post-transplant, you know, life, life is, uh, has been really, really good. Two and a half years post-transplant. Um, you know, there's some bumps in the road. I had CMV uh, hospitalized for a bit for that. You know, there's some, some other issues, but you know, I, I feel the best that I felt probably in 15 years. I've been swimming a half a mile, uh, down here, you know, every other day. Uh, and, uh, the, the, you know, so, so, so it's wonderful. It's good. There's a lot of medications you have to stay on top of. Um, I should be a lot more careful because the immunosuppression, uh, AKA my grandkids and what I ever <laughs> have right now. But, you know, I can't help but hug and kiss my grandkids when I'm around them. I've had three grandkids uh, be born since I've had uh, a transplant. I, I could have missed that, right? So, you know, I, I say the only thing I'm, my grandkids can get me sick, I don't care. Uh, and, and I'm not gonna put on a mask. I'm not gonna stop hugging and kissing them. Uh, but it's, you know, life is so wonderful. Uh, I've got a new lease. I feel great. Uh, and, and it's such a, it's, 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 it's such a, I guess to say honor and blessing to be able to be here today. And, and so one of the things is, you know, as I talked to companies like Rocca and a lot of researchers three years ago, when we were really getting, you know, you know, we've just really been going pretty strongly with the foundation three years after I medically retired from my old business, um, and that we, you know, I said, how can we help you as a patient group? You know, what, what can we do? And every researcher in biopharma company said, you know, you know, there is a lot of interest in um, genetic therapies for cardiomyopathy. Um, but what we lack, given the number of genes and the genotypical expression, phenotypical, why does some people express and the other person doesn't? We need to have a lot more people tested in order to create these better drugs faster. So that's why we created GCAC, and that's why we're being very aggressive and pretty loud to the medical community um, about this. And then we also uh, created it not as just DCM, because I think one of the problems the patient groups have, have had is, you know, we're the only country in the world where you have you know, hypertrophic DCM, arrhythmogenic groups. And I think that there needs to be, uh, there needs to be programs strictly at the cardiomyopathy basis, like Cardiomyopathy UK, because so many of the genes cross over. I was talking to Stephanie Fallon that runs her Facebook groups, and she and her kids have a number of genes, MOH7. It's manifest as DCM with her. Um, I think she has TPM1, but there's LVNC, there's restrictive, there's HCM. So inner family expresses differently. So I think we've done ourselves a disservice by really, by really typecasting these things in the subcategory when really on a genetic basis, you know, a gene, uh, a g a gene mutation can express itself in a lot of different ways. So we've decided to attack, attack this on a cardiomyopathy wide basis, not necessarily DCM, HCM, AC, ACM, LVNC restrictive, so. Thank you, thank you, Greg, and certainly here at Rocket, we can relate to what you're saying to <laughs> genetics testing so we can really uh, advance innovation for cardiomyopathy. 
So I think, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Um, really, really grateful to, to Becky, to Abby, to Greg for sharing your stories, educating us on, on your disease, the, your journeys, and advocating for more genetic testing so we can advance uh, treatments and potentially cure. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll to this session.